This episode of Accelerate is brought to you in part by Discover Org. Looking to close four times as many deals in half the time? Discover Org's industry leading human verified sales intelligence gives you all of the data and insights like direct dials, org charts, planned projects, verified emails, and executive moves. You need to stop wasting time on research and spend more time talking to the right decision maker with the right message at the right time. Their team of 250 plus sales researchers do all the work so that you don't have to. 2,500 companies are already using Discover Org to win more deals. So check them out at www.discoverorg.com. That's www.discoverorg.com. It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 582 of Accelerate, 582 episodes of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation I'm having with my guest today. Joining me on the show is Jeff Colvin. Jeff's the senior editor at large of Fortune Magazine and the New York Times bestselling author of Talent is Overrated, What Really Separates World-Class Performers from Everybody Else. And uh, I'll just pause for a second and say that's a book I heartily recommend that people read. Uh, and then the book we're going to talk about today, which I also very much enjoyed and recommend to everyone, it's called Humans Are Underrated, What High Achievers Know That Brilliant Machines Never Will. And so we're going to start by talking about the impact, the historical impact, the widespread adoption of certain technologies have had on our economy and employment over the past key points over the past 200 years. Then we use that as the lens to look forward to what's happening really today and in the near future with the technological advances we're seeing with AI and other, again, other technologies. And then we're going to dive into what it's going to mean to be a great performer in this new machine age of AI and brilliant machines. And what are the skills, we're going to talk about what are the skills we're all going to need to master in order to achieve and become great performers in this environment. So you don't want to miss this conversation. If you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, go to annypaul.com forward slash 582. As always, you'll see there are timestamp breakdown of this and all conversations on Accelerate. In the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about a new report I just produced. It's based on the input of over 300 leading sales experts, entrepreneurs, seasoned business executives, people I've interviewed right here on Accelerate, as a matter of fact. And the support is all about what you can do to amp up and accelerate your sales right now. So it's a free sort of step-by-step guide that you can follow to put some more oomph and pizzazz into your sales. The report is free. You want to go to accelerate.fm forward slash accelerate to get your copy right now. That's accelerate.fm forward slash accelerate to get your copy. Before we get to Jeff Colvin, let me remind you that today's show is brought to you in part by our friends at Discover.org. The Discover Org platform is a game changer for sales, marketing, and staffing professionals. The feature-rich sales intelligence platform is supported by 250-plus researchers who continually update the contact data and provide account-specific insights to help sales marketing teams break ahead of the pack. See the product live at discoverorg.com forward slash schedule hyphen demo. That's discoverorg.com forward slash schedule hyphen demo. This month, as we talked about on our previous episode, is October, the anniversary month of Accelerate. Again, we don't go for just celebrating just a single day of anniversary. We got a whole month. And let's see, two years ago today, my guest was Jeb Blunt. Episode 15, we talked about the importance of fanatical prospecting. So what's been your favorite episode? I mean, who's been your favorite guest or favorite topic to discuss? So let me know. We want to hear back from you what's been your, your favorite. So if you need to review the episodes, go to andypaul.com forward slash podcast hyphen quick podcast reference. That's the complete list of episodes that we've aired so far. Then go to andypaul.com homepage. Lower right-hand corner, there's a red button that says ask a question. Actually, you can use that to leave us an audio message with what your favorite episode has been. If you do that today, I'll send you a signed copy of my book, Amp Up Your Sales. Just remember to leave your physical mailing address so we can get that book to you. Finally, before we get to the interview, as always, remind you we want to hear about your sales challenges, the questions you might have about a particular situation with a customer or a sales management challenge you have, and we'll answer. We'll choose a question each week to answer. I'll answer those on Friday episodes with my co-host, Bridget Gleason. So 
If you send your questions, you can do that via email at andy at andypaul.com. Or again, back to andypaul.com homepage, lower right-hand corner, red button that says Ask a Question. Actually, you can just click on that and leave us an audio message. And the person whose question we choose to answer will win a free half-hour coaching call with me. That's a $250 value, so make sure you don't delay. Do that today. And actually, this week, we're actually rolling out the first of those, those coaching calls. So submit your question. All right, let's jump into it with Jeff Colvin. Jeff, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you, Andy. Hey, pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to have you. Really enjoy your books. Talents is overrated. Humans are underrated. Um, and we're going to jump into some of that here shortly. But before we get started, I've, I have a question I ask all my guests at the start of the show. And, and even though you're not specifically in sales, I thought you'd be well positioned to answer this. In your mind, because that leads into what we're going to talk about today, What's the single biggest challenge you think facing sales reps today? Well, uh, honestly, I think it is, it's for themselves. It is understanding the degree to which they are threatened by technology. Uh, It's very easy for a sales rep to think that, you know, technology can take out all kinds of mechanical work and, you know, routine work and stuff like that. But surely what I do, you know, dealing with my customers or my prospective customers, you know, no machine could ever uh, take over that function. And it simply isn't true. And the, the, we'll go into this, I suspect, a little mm-hmm. more. But, but, but fully appreciating the threat I think is going to prove to be the the greatest challenge facing sales reps today. Well, there's been sort of no shortage of predictions that right. business to business sales in particular, which is our audience yes. is primarily business to business sales, you know, is faced with an existential threat from technology. I mean, right. Forrester Research Group put out this report that I think every salesperson in the world is aware of. Right. I think they put it out in 2015 saying by 2020, fully 20% of the B2B sales jobs will have been gone eliminated yeah. um which two years into that five-year period that hasn't begun to really happen yet but right. but it's not that it couldn't as you say right. yeah so, that's absolutely right and, and you know he, he here's what he, here's where a lot of the disagreement i think is it may my own view is it may well be that some significant percentage of b2b sales jobs disappear but those will be the b2b sales jobs that are not being done very well by the people doing it. Exactly. Right. right? I mean, it, it, these things are immune to, te- to technology takeover only if the, the salesperson is doing something that the technology really cannot do. And there are always a number of salespeople out there who, frankly, are not doing anything that the technology cannot do. Exactly. Yeah, it's sort of like they let it happen to them, and and that's part we're gonna we're gonna get into as we get into. It. But I wanted to sort of set the stage a little bit because you've written extensively about changes in the economy that relates to how technology is going to affect employment. And I thought it'd be really good to give people sort of a you know a, a background about that and some of the things you've written. And I, one of the things that struck me, and one of the things I read is that you gave the example about how, uh, which surprised me, is like the single largest employment of males in America are truck drivers. Right. <laughs> exactly so, right. So, so 2.9 million t- truck drivers. Yep. And who would have thought that they would face such a threat from technology? Right. No one ever imagined that that, that job would be threatened by technology. And it's not that many years ago, what, maybe 10 years ago, that, uh, you know, some very smart economists, whom I greatly respect, uh, wrote a book in which they said that, you know, they just happened to give that as an example. In fact, they said, you know, driving a truck, when you think of all the sensory input that the driver has to process and the split second decisions they have to be have to make about whether to make a left turn against oncoming traffic, they said that is such an enormously complex job, in fact, that computers are just not going to be able to do it. Well, you know, I think it only took four years after that before <laughs> Google introduced its first self-driving car. And today, uh, you know, a, a truck now has actually made, an autonomous truck has made a commercial delivery. Uh, it was done late last year for the first time, and we can see where this is going. 
Well, and I, I think of an example of myself from, I remember, oh, back in the late 90s, working for a, a tech company, uh, we were in the wireless and satellite communication space, and we were working with the U.S. government on a smart highway program. Mm. And they were talking about, yeah, we we're going to have driverless cars, but it required, at that time, the vision was that you're going to have to embed right. things rem- into the roadbed, right? <laughs> yeah, I remember this. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. You had to put wires in in the concrete there. Yeah, basically sensors. So it, it, it knew where it was going to go. And the cars, uh, the cars were going to come by and pick you up. It was going to be like getting onto the highway. It's going to be like, uh, what was going to look like? TDMA communications protocol, if you're <laughs> packet communication <laughs> switching, basically, is how the cars were going to get in and off the roads. And you think, gosh, it's just in you know, 15, 20 years, yeah, how radically things had changed. So to your point earlier, is, you know, salespeople are sitting here sort of dumb, fat, and happy is thinking, yeah, I can't ever be replaced because what I do is so unique, then, yeah, that's not really the case. And I, and I, and I thought it'd be interesting to sort of go through, you sort of, I found fascinating, is, is sort of four turning points um, in sort of the technology relating to the nature of work. And first one being the industrial technology, industrial revolution. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to sort of go through, I don't know if you recall those from that article you'd written. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, exactly. The fr- and I, I <laughs> the truth is, I may ask you for a little help on. Oh, that's it. fine. That's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, sure, sir. Sure. So of course we started with the industrial revolution and so forth. Uh, after that, I suspect was the um, arrival of uh, basically electricity. Uh, electricity, it's, yeah. uh, exactly, which uh, was such a huge technological advance that. Um, Many companies simply applied electricity to their existing processes and structures. But the most successful companies said, ah, this actually enables us to structure our company and processes in entirely new ways. And so they did. When, um, I, say, I thought the thing that was ahead. really interesting about the, the sort of this, these four points is that what it did is sort of flip flop who who is benefiting from an employment standpoint yes. in terms of skill levels. So yes. the industrial technology revolution benefited unskilled workers right. because you know these repetitive tasks. It didn't you know the artisans became outmoded, and then you moved into the it's just as we talked about the you know, widespread electrification of the economy. Suddenly, yeah, you know, it required better educated workers to operate these more complex machines, and the unskilled workers were out of luck. Yep, exactly then, right. And then it started coming back around again. Yes, that's it. That, that's exactly what's happening. And it's very unusual and striking and uh, disorienting for many people because what's happening now. I, and so, look, for most of the 20th century, the story was pretty simple. Uh, higher education led to better skills, better jobs. Uh, and it was a wonderful, you know, t- as technology advanced, people required better education. And so these two things advanced together and it was a great thing. And this is a large part of what made America the largest economy in the world in the 20th century. Um, and ri- very rapidly rising living standards and all worked great. What is happening now is just what you say. Suddenly it's kind of going back the other way. Um, what we're seeing is that starting some years ago, the returns to higher education, college education, uh, started to diminish. Mm -hmm. And it actually, even the researchers who documented most thoroughly the greater importance of college education through the 20th century have now said, you know, that seems to have run its course. And the technology has become so advanced now that it's doing more and more things that even college-educated people were doing previously and taking jobs away from more highly educated people. And this is, this is something we're having, a, we as a nation, as a society, are having a lot of trouble uh, adapting to. When you give the example, oh, well, first of all, we can see the examples all around where to become you know, let's say an administrative role, you know, if you become an admin for somebody, requires a college degree. Right. <laughs> Where, uh, right. <laughs> not that you're using those skills at all, but you requires a college degree. Right. Which whole separate discussion about, yeah, appropriateness of that and the college debt and so on. But but I thought one of those more striking examples you gave about about technology encroaching into, you know, sort of higher end skilled jobs was the examples you wrote about about lawyers. 
Yes, and and this re- tells us a lot, and and should really it's a cautionary um, set of facts, not just for lawyers, but for all kinds of other people. So what we see happening is that uh, technology is now doing a lot of work that young lawyers used to do, specifically. Um, the process of discovery in a lawsuit Mm -hmm. uh, where the other side has to give you documents, which could be thousands or hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. And for years, young lawyers, associates at law firms, got the job of going through those vast mountains of documents, trying to figure out which ones were relevant and which ones were not, and what were the parts of those documents that were going to be important in the case. And, you know, the time of those associates was billed at a pretty good hourly Mm -hmm. rate, and it took a lot of hours to do it. Well, increasingly, young lawyers don't do this at all anymore. Technology does it. It can read those documents And it can sort the relevant ones from the irrelevant ones, at least as well as human lawyers can. It never gets tired or distracted. It can (laughs) and it can do and it, you know, it doesn't drink and, you know, and it it can do something that even excellent lawyers cannot do, which is it can read a hundred thousand pages of documents and spot patterns in there that no human would have been able to discern, but it can spot significant patterns that are going to make a difference. And so here's the thing. It's doing the work not only faster and cheaper than humans, it's doing it better. And that is impossible to fight. And it's one reason that even major law firms, some of them are downsizing now. And Mm -hmm. it's one reason that law schools uh, in the United States uh, overall are in crisis. And some of the smaller ones and less elite ones are shrinking, a few of them even closing down, some of them cutting tuition. Who would have thought this was possible? Nobody. Well, yeah, especially think about all those law school grads that (laughs) aren't aren't getting jobs, right? That aren't getting jobs. This is really an epidemic. Or if they're getting jobs at all, they're not in law. Right, right. Yeah. Or maybe it's an inside, you know, corporate thing. But it's yeah, it's not doing what they set out to do, and certainly not uh, helping them pay off their debt. The way yeah, I was going to say <laughs> it's not what they spent all that money to go to law school for. So in the higher end jobs, you say that you know the meaning of of being a great performer really changed. Yes, where it used to be you had to be machine like. Now yes. it's about being good at being human. That's exactly right. And this is a a really fundamental change that we're still struggling with. But a, a, a lot of the work that humans used to do, truthfully, was inhuman work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was adding up columns of numbers, or it was retyping letters, or it was redrawing blueprints. And technology has done away, has taken over those jobs. Now it's taking over jobs that we thought only humans could do. And so being a better machine, which is essentially what used to make us more valuable employees, doesn't work anymore. Now we have to be as deeply, utterly human as we can possibly be. We have to relate with, and that, what that means is relating with other human beings in a way that so far at least no machine can do having that you know building that deep relationship that's one human to another that simply does not get formed with uh machines and that is going to be important to that other person that's where competitive advantage arises now yeah, I mean, I love the way you put it. They said that you know, the to look into someone's eyes, actually, yes. <laughs> both yes. metaphorically and literally, yes. is is the key to creating value. It, it is, and and I'm glad you you recalled that because looking into someone's eyes literally turns out to be an incredibly important thing. There's all kinds of magic that happens only. When we look into each other's eyes, literally in mm-hmm. person, mm-hmm. in person, face to face, 
stuff goes on that we are not consciously aware of. For one thing, if we are talking to each other in person, face to face, our brains literally synchronize. The researchers right. have you know, put these sensors on people's heads and the, the same parts of the brain light up at the same time. The, the idea of be, being in sync with someone else is actually not a metaphor. It happens literally. And if you have that same conversation standing two feet apart, but back to back, the synchronization disappears. Uh, when we look each other in the eye, the pupils of our eyes dilate and constrict in sympathy with one another. We have no conscious awareness that this mm -hmm. is happening. But it is happening, and the researchers have found that this builds trust. We unconsciously mimic one another's posture. We mimic one another's tone of voice. We don't know we're doing it, but that is building trust also. So there, there is this magic that happens mm -hmm. only when human beings are in person face to face. Well, and the thing that's really interesting about that is there is this huge trend in sales toward inside sales. and. Yes. And one of the things that's happening, especially like I'll take like the SaaS industry, is you look at yep. their ultimate close rates or conversion rates, whatever term they want to call, and they're not very good. Right now, they make it up in volume. Right? right. I mean, they're, they're yes. out on the front end, uh, burning through hundreds and thousands of prospects <laughs> to get those deals. But you know, I've made the point to several of the sales leaders in that field: is yeah, if you want to increase that. Get people on a plane. Go back and talk to somebody. Right? right? You want to do everything remotely, but there's huge value. To you just said, is yeah. actually it's, yes, it's more costly. Maybe you don't do it on every deal, but there's such value for actually being with a person and you get the as you said, you get that synchronicity, that mirroring that that starts taking place. Yeah, that's exactly right. An interesting phenomenon that's going on is the rise of uh, conferences. Um, you know, big uh, meetings mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, I can tell you that in our business, the magazine, what we used to call the magazine business, <laughs> uh, conferences are turning out to be a more and more important part of the business. At Fortune, we do a lot of them. Other magazines right. are doing a lot of them. How come, you know, how come in the digital age, bringing people physically together is a growing and profitable business. Well, it's because there is something that happens only when those people are physically together. And a lot of people are willing to pay money for it. It's valuable. Yeah, well, we certainly see it in the sales, the sales industry. I mean, our tech industry, so on, but I'm talking about the sales business per se. But yeah, um, yeah it's sort of funny. There's sort of a, a limited appetite that you find, though, too, is after about the fourth or fifth conference, People stop going, but um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but there is yeah, there is real real value to that. So another point I wanted to explore because perhaps some really interesting research that there seemed to be a you know a contradiction in this is so you you cited research from Oxford Economics that they s surveyed employers. Employers said, hey, in the next five ten years, you know, we don't need the conventional sort of uh, you know left brain skills, you know, business right. acumen analysis, you know. So on, what we need are right brain, relationship building, teaming, collaboration, co-creativity, brainstorming, so on, and and empathy. Yes. But but then you also cite research saying that that empathy is actually sort of in a shortfall these days. You know, surveys yeah. of college grads is actually the level of empathy is actually decreasing. So. What do you think accounts for this gap? I mean, this is what we need, but you know, we've got this declining empathy. Well, it's a, it, it is a very profound point, I think. And in a way, what accounts for the gap, for this divergence, is um, the rise of technology having both effects. Uh, companies are finding that they need more people with those skills, not just for external reasons, such as salespeople will experience, you know, when they're mm -hmm. out selling, but also for internal reasons within organizations. Uh, the way teams work together, for example, uh, which is increasingly how all work gets done, uh, it, 
it is enormously important to have people who have these deep uh, human skills, these deep skills of human interaction. Uh, so, uh, you know, as teams become more and more important, these skills that you were listing become more and more important. At the same time, however, as you say, there's plenty of research showing that those skills are in shorter supply. Uh, for example, there is a, uh, a long history of research on college students being rated on this scale of empathy that mm -hmm. researchers put together a long time. Well, it's been declining uh, since about, well, for many, many years. Uh, college students, on average, score lower on empathy. How come? Well, we could postulate a lot of things, but we do know that um, other research shows increasing use of tech of digital technology, you know, looking into screens, right. communicating with our thumbs, uh, seems to cause to, seems to weaken empathy. In fact, it, it shows this very clearly. Now, look, we are not going to we are not going to stop using digital technology. <laughs> no, we are, no. you know, we're, we're this is not this is never going away. We're not going to give up. Uh, everything, all the phones and everything that we've got, we can't live without them. I can't live without them. We're no. not going to. We're not going to give these things up. They're going to be embedded under our skins. They are. That's next. That's exactly right. And uh, so, fine. It, it's not going away. But we must realize what we're losing along with what we're gaining from these technologies. And one of the things we're losing is deep skills of human interaction. Empathy being the foundational skill of human interaction. And that, you know, look, declining supply combined with increasing demand equals greater value. And so that's why empathy and the other skills of deep human interaction are becoming much more valuable. Well, and interestingly, as you point out, is that as we look, and this is especially relevant for sales, which is still, like many fields, is dominated by men, yes. is that, <laughs> yeah, the greater value you put on empathy is the greater value that they have for hiring women into those that, roles. That's exactly right. And, and you know, when, when I talk about these issues with groups, I often say to them, Okay, look, I, I, I've just described to you all of these skills and I've described to you their value. Now, on average, who do you think is better at these skills of deep human interaction, men or women? You get one guess. <laughs> and everybody laughs because they realize, you know, of course we know. And I say, look, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of research supporting the answer to that question, but yes. do we really, do we need the research at all? Don't we all know from life experience that on average women are better at these skills than men are? It doesn't mean all women are better than all men. That's not correct. And we can all get better than we are. Right. But going in, on average, women are better than men at these high value skills. Well, I think then it, it really points to especially when you're bringing you know, new generations of workers into the workforce, especially in sales, is that you know, the training process and the ongoing education process, you know, not this one time, hey, we're going to train you for two weeks and then you're done type thing, but the ongoing education of people in the workforce, especially sellers, has to really focus on these behaviors, I call them, these habits, selling habits, empathy and so on, as opposed to building relationship, connecting with individual as opposed to the traditional sort of closing skills, tactical skills that they really focus on, because yeah. hey, yeah. you know the the stereotypical sales closer. Yeah. I've I've <laughs> you know, I've thought it's been a myth for for years, but it's truly going to become a thing of the past here very shortly if it hasn't already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. Uh, it, it's absolutely right, and these are the skills. So the skills we're talking about now. Uh, as being the most valuable skills are not skills that typically get trained very much. And in fact, there are some people who think they can't be trained. They think, you know, it's kind of a natural thing. You know, mm. you've got it or you, you come into this world uh, wired that way or you don't. And obviously that is not true. These skills 
can be trained. They are being trained now by a number of institutions uh, around the world. But most companies still don't understand that they can be trained, let alone understand how to train them. Well, and I think I think there's going to be a certain. I think that's true. I mean, I think unfortunately, a lot of the training for these types of things sort of fall into. You know, if you're in sales, suddenly it starts finding, feeling like sensitivity training and so on. Yes, right. Which which is yeah, there's an element of that because we have increasingly diverse workforces and yeah. and increasingly diverse set of customers, and yeah. which is you know a really critical point for people to understand as they're selling into a major enterprise is that. As we talked about, you know, more people involved in the decision, more committee based is, yeah, they're going to be way more diverse than they were in the past, and you need to be sensitive to that. But, but yeah, these these soft skills sort of make people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But but it, that's the future for sellers. Yeah, you know, if you if you yeah. want to succeed, and and I'm saying this to the people listening to this is, if you want to succeed. This is your path to success. This is your path to having a long term career in sales. Is emphasizing these skills. As well as your product knowledge and customer knowledge, for sure, because that's how you're going to help collaborate with them. But you know, the saying, "Hey, I want to be able to give the best pitch possible." Yeah, that's yeah. not really the thing these days. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned product knowledge and customer knowledge. You know, all certainly important, but there's a very broad trend, which is that knowledge in general is becoming commoditized. It used to be such a differentiator mm. uh, among all of us, you know, that you knew stuff that somebody else didn't know. Well, there is less, you know, that can still make a big difference, but every day there is less and less that I know that everybody else in the world can't find in 10 seconds. Yep. Right? It, 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 knowledge is becoming radically more available. So, in, you know, yeah, it's still important for sure, but less and less is it going to be how I am better at my job than somebody else is at this kind of job. We, we've got to look elsewhere for competitive advantage. And it's at this, this we talked about, you know, the emphasizing, exercising the more uniquely human skills that are going to be the way you connect, build trust, uh, get engagement in a way that yeah, I think is is the real differentiator. And really it's you know, a line I used in my first book years ago is, you know, it's really it's about how you sell, not what you sell. Right. And the how uh being from the human aspect of it. Right. Not right. Not yeah, you know, how you pitch and so on and so <laughs> forth. It's just how you connect. And I and I, I agree with you. I think I think these capabilities are all all in us. Yeah, you know, yes. if you read, yes, you know, Duhigg about habits and other people about habits is, as we all say, we all come with all the habits. We're not creating yes. new. We're not creating new habits. We're right. just changing habits. Yeah, which is a yeah. really different approach, right? We all have these capabilities to be empathetic, to collaborate, to you know, co-create, uh, to yes. lead, yes. build relationships. Yes, I, I, I do believe that we all have what it takes. We, we, we do all have what's, what, what it takes to succeed in this world of new, newly valuable skills. It, they're in there. They want to get out. Um, we just have to help them get out. Yeah. Well, I'm going to close with just a, another a quote from one of the things you'd written. Is, you, know, you said, hey, this is wonderful news, that, paraphrasing that, but the quote is, just think of what we're being asked to do to become more essentially human to be the creatures we once were and were always meant to be. I love it. Couldn't have, couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, you did. Well, excellent. <laughs> well, well, Jeff, thank you very much for joining me on the show. It's been fantastic. Uh, tell folks how they can find out more about you and connect with you. Well, the easiest way to do it is uh, jeffcolvin.com, but I always have to spell it because uh, I spell Jeff, Jeff uh, right? <laughs> the English Maybe way. So it's uh, it, G-E-O-F-F. Colvin, C O L V I N, jeffcolvin.com. And uh, they can find everything they need about books and my fortune work and everything else right there. Excellent. Yeah. Make sure you check Jeff out on fortune.com. So, Jeff, thank you. Friends, thanks for spending this time with us today. Remember, please come back. Join us again tomorrow for another fantastic episode of Accelerate. So, I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. 